Well, thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, it's really special to be here and to see uh, familiar faces and, and meet new ones. Uh, I'm a year in the role now here at Baptist World Aid Australia, and I've been pastoring for the last 18-odd years. And as Josh mentioned, we had a, a Bible college together and various things like that. But you guys have been supporting Baptist World Aid's work for a long time. Since 2001, collectively, you've raised over $328,000 for Baptist World Aid. So thank you so much. And I was looking forward to sharing with you a bit about how that happens. Uh, part of what your partnership has been going towards in the recent few years has been to Nepal. And I actually got back from Nepal last week. So I'm going to be tying in some of that into what I'm sharing today, but also your generous supporters of the Matching Grant Fund, which is a yearly fund that gets matched fivefold by the Australian government. So that's really wonderful, and that's because uh, we have an accreditation with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trading as a best practice organisation, um, so that you can be sure that when you give, it's going to go exactly where you want it to go, and actually we're leading the space in terms of accountability and program effectiveness overseas. So that's really exciting. And uh, you guys have been talking about the Christmas appeal. I see you've already got it up in your hallway there. And I think I've got the next slide there, please, uh, Christine. And uh, this is your appeal. We're raising money for um, where it's needed most. So basically, wherever our programs are operating, we're, we're active in about 22 different countries around the world. Uh, those are long-term developments. We have five emergency appeals happening now in Gaza and Ukraine and Uganda uh, and Lebanon, to name a few. So whether it's immediate healthcare, nutrition stuff for a quick need. So we had five shipments go into Gaza um, over the last year, which is, if you know about the blockades, that's a really great win. It's helped over 5,000 people, which has been great. And then we have the long uh, nine-year developments that happen across five different countries, and that's also where the sponsor children come in, etc. So it's a broad range of work that Baptist World Aid does, and my role in Western Australia is to help churches to partner in an area that they really enjoy to partner with. So we're going to watch a video now about the Christmas appeal, and then we'll uh, get into the sermon. About the Vaughan. Big heart, big smile. At a glance you wouldn't realise he knows poverty firsthand, has been bullied for his disability, taken advantage of financially. Struggling to support his family, the Vaughan took a loan, not realising predatory lenders would lock him into a high interest rate and long-term debt. So why is the Vaughan smiling? He found a way out. With supporters like you, contributing to local solutions, tackling poverty. By learning new farming methods, Devon started a business. Now raises chickens, cultivates veggies, supplies food for his family and his community. Dealing with debt was the start. Now Thavon provides his children with school supplies and dreams, new dreams for their future. So how is this a Christmas story? Or shouldn't that story about Christ moving in, bringing light into darkness, shape how we see every other story? Give today to bring joy and fight poverty like the Vaughan this Christmas. Great, thank you. So um, I can attest to this work. So I was sitting with uh, groups of women in cooperative groups in Nepal, and they're also being shown uh, farming methods that help to uh, double and triple even their yields every year. They're taught how to uh, get seeds for the following year so that they don't have to buy seeds, and then they plant those seeds, and they grow seedlings, and then they sell the seedlings, and um, really fascinating. There's uh, mushroom farming techniques where they 
boil bags of hay and then put the mushroom spores in and hang them sort of inside a, a curved plastic dome and then all the mushrooms grow out the sides of the plastic bags and they get you know 300 kilos of mushrooms to feed their family and then sell that and they just have a collective purse that they then lift themselves out of poverty. So this is the whole idea. We're not coming in saying, hey, we've got all the answers. We sit down and we co-design with the locals who know what their needs are on the ground. And so uh, this Christmas, there's also um, a double grant for uh, whatever you give. It gets doubled um, to make an impact. So uh, I'll be at the stall at the back, and there are a few um, giving slips floating around there. Obviously, um, I'm very happy to have a chat, and please do come and get um, a bookmark, a prayer calendar, and also a free devotional book if you'd like to learn more. Uh, next slide, please. And so what I'd like to say to you today is that you are part of God's restoration plan. And let's read here from Isaiah the prophet. So he's an Old Testament prophet, and we, he lived around 700 years before the birth of Christ. And this is what he says. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. I want to go to the next slide, please. And the thing is, is that poverty is not simple. If that's you in the middle there, we can have a, a, a brokenness or a poverty with ourselves, understanding who we are as people, with others, relational issues, and with the planet, because we've been given custodianship of our planet by the Lord in Genesis, and yet we don't treat our planet right. We have a broken relationship with God, and this is a spiritual poverty, but then we also have economic, political, religious, and social systems that are set up to function to support people, but these are also corrupt and broken as well. And as we have seen in Thavorn's story, it's actually a bunch of these things coalescing together to form a polycrisis that leads to poverty that's entrenched, and it's actually very hard to get out of. And so... In terms of the uh, economic system, it doesn't support the people in Cambodia. And so Thavorn tries to get a loan, but then those lenders are sharks and they really are just taking far more interest than they should and it spirals into debt and to poverty. Relationally, he experiences poverty because he's being bullied for his disability. Politically, Although the tides are changing with the work of NGOs in these uh, non-government organisations in those countries. For example, in Nepal, where uh, actually child marriage is rife, and I've heard first-hand stories about that. For instance, our guide, uh, his grandmother m was married at seven years old to a 21-year-old. And that is actually seen uh, very holy and, and a special thing in Hinduism. Although now the country has banned it, they say child marriage uh, is no longer legal, but because the vast majority of people are illiterate, they don't understand. And so the youth groups that we're working with now get trained to be able to share this kind of knowledge. And so they go out into the villages and they actually do drama plays, teaching the people through drama. That, that these practices are changing. And so hope is not lost. We're seeing sparks of life everywhere, and because of your support, we're seeing these changes start to happen. Uh, next slide, please. But how does all of this relate to Jesus? Well, as we heard, Jesus is light in the darkness, and I find it audacious that believers like us, people who follow Christ in Australia, are making an impact Overseas, It's just wonderful, and I can attest to that taking place. But what we're going to do now is we're going to turn over to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 14. And so what has happened in the lead-up to this is that Jesus has been out in the wilderness. He was led by the Holy Spirit out in the to the wilderness where he was actually tested for 40 days. He didn't eat or drink. And we know that uh, Satan, or the, the evil one, the tempter, the liar, the accuser, etc., um, actually the enemy of our souls, was there testing Jesus. And you see that he overcame those tests. And one of the first things that he does is comes and he speaks at the, the synagogue. And so 
I'm going to read from verse 14 of Luke chapter 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they said? So he's the hometown boy. They've seen him grow up. Are you claiming, Jesus, that what the prophet Isaiah spoke about 700 years ago, you are fulfilling now? Well, we've been waiting for this moment, but we don't see it. Where's the evidence? We're still under Roman oppression. Times are tough. You know, we're being brutalized and identity shamed. Okay, they're not seeing the evidence, but they will. And over the next three years of Jesus' ministry, until he goes to the cross, we see the evidence that he is this one. I'm just going to unpack four of these today for us. And so the first one, next slide please, is Jesus' claim that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on him. So quite literally, we see in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, the first of the Gospels, that Jesus is baptised by John the Baptist. And in that moment... It says that the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove and it's God's seal and a voice from heaven is heard. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So quite literally there is an event where you have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit and God the Son Jesus, the triune God active all at once, crossing metaphysical boundaries. It's just unbelievable. Bang, but there it is, the spirit of the sovereign Lord resting on Jesus. And because of that spirit of the sovereign Lord, Jesus' purpose is very clear. And I was chatting with Buster before the service. Jesus had a purpose and his purpose was to seek and to save the lost sheep of Israel, it says in Matthew 15, 24. He knew his purpose. Of course, his his ministry was wider than that. He He was out and he was healing people of all different creeds and nations all around him. My point today for us is that if we have made a decision to follow Jesus, if we've surrendered our lives and and have been born again, which means that we've accepted Christ, then the Bible promises us that that same Holy Spirit also rests on us. And so we'll go to that next slide, please. Because you are a follower of Christ, you have that Holy Spirit. Your purpose is also now secure and known. That purpose is that greatest commandment, that we would love God and that we would love others. That's, that's our purpose. And then from there, we have gifts and talents and all sorts of nuanced other things that we, we put to work for the sake of the kingdom of God. And that term kingdom of God just basically means that as it happens in heaven, as God wills it to be, so it is taking place on earth because the kingdom of heaven has already started to advance. It's already leaning towards what it's going to be like in eternity. And this is very exciting that we get to partner and participate in that. But our purpose is to participate in helping other people to realise their own purpose. So for people like the Vaughan and for uh, the women and children and youth that I was sitting with in Nepal... When poverty is present, often purpose is lost. And especially people now fleeing from the Middle East, they've left their businesses back there, right there, and they're sitting in refugee camps and they're idle and they're, you know, they're not, what are they going to do? And and that brings on depression and all sorts of different things. And so it's just fascinating that Jesus actually inspires us to go out to our neighbours and help them to recognise that they do have a purpose. And so I wonder if there's somebody for you who comes to mind when thinking about purpose and I wonder what it means for you to to be near them, to walk with them and to be pointing to the one, Jesus, who is able to give purpose for life. 
And so next uh, slide, please. Jesus has been uh, anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. And this word poor in the, in the Greek uh, manuscript, the Septuagint, it's, the word there is tukoi, and it means to have absolutely nothing. So you're scraping the barrel and you, and you come up with nothing. And this tukoi, it's used in two contexts by Jesus in terms of material poverty and also in terms of spiritual poverty. Luke 6, chapter 20, blessed are the tukoi, the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This speaks to material poverty. In Matthew, Matthew 5, 3, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the tukoi in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, why is this good news? Well, if you're somebody like Thavorn or somebody who is, who is marginalised and who doesn't get to set their own life agenda because they are powerless, like Jesus' original hearers, oppressed by the Roman Empire, not able to have self-determination, the fact that here is one claiming to be the Son of God who says that his eternal kingdom is going to come and guess what? You are on the inside it is actually through you that I am going to bring this kingdom to come. This is fascinating because this turns the whole structure of society on its head. Those who think that they are coming first are actually going to be coming last. And the last will be first. So this is brilliant news. And I can imagine that the power brokers, you know, that the Pharisees or the Romans who may be standing there at the Sermon on the Mount listening to Jesus, they're thinking... What is this guy on about? I have the power. Why would I need this rabbi? Okay, but they're the ones who are in trouble. And so we need to recognize that while we may have some form of material wealth here in Australia, relative, but compared to other places in the world, yes, that we actually can suffer from a spiritual poverty. And it's fascinating that when you go overseas, that it's actually the reverse. I've encountered people who love God, who have absolutely nothing, but they're so spiritually rich. But they you know, can barely rub two pennies together and we can just learn so much from our brothers and sisters in different countries as they teach us about this. But Jesus proclaims good news to the poor. And so next slide there, please. Jesus invites us to participate in the restoration of material and spiritual poverty. Um, I just love to see when I came this morning that you have your collection of food that are going out to families in need, and that's what this is. That is restoration of material poverty. And as you do that, it sparks something in people to say, there's something more. People can feel it. People can sense when that generosity because of being given to them people start to become curious. And that's wonderful. So I encourage you that as you get involved in these works that Jesus initiated, but he's asked us to carry them on, that you know that, that there is restoration that can happen. And I'm seeing it really in, in Nepal. There are so many visible ways that the communities are, are being lifted out of poverty. They have less diseases because they know, now know how to, uh, how to wash and sanitise correctly. Their children are being uh, educated and so that I was talking about the illiteracy. It's being broken over the, the last few generations and it's wonderful and it enables them to be able to make a life for themselves and to, and to get jobs, etc. as they move forward. What it also does is that the good works of our Christian partners overseas, as they live in community and as they do good works, it actually sows so many seeds because they say, who are these Christians? They're really good people. Look at them living among us, loving us, not forceful, none of these things. And then what happens is when the time is right, the local churches get empowered by the work and the local churches come and they share the gospel and the harvest is big. And so we've seen um, 500 churches uh, over the last 20 years spring up in places like Nepal because of this work happening. And it's just fantastic. So thanks for that. Okay, number three. Uh, next slide, please. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And we all know that there are many ways that our hearts can be wounded. And some of us carry woundings 
for years and for decades and our hearts are fragile. But Jesus is the one who wants to bind up and and the word there in the Hebrew, which is the uh, original uh, language of the the Jews, is korbash, which means to, to bandage and to wrap, almost to splint, but to set the bone back in place in such a way that it's going to bring healing. Get rid of all the gunk and to, and to set that bone back in place properly. The prophet Jeremiah, also an Old Testament prophet, says this, and, it's, and he's speaking as a, as a mouthpiece of God here. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead or ointment in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? This is Jeremiah 8, 21. But it's, it's almost a rhetorical question because we sit on the New Testament side of history. We do know that there is a physician for our souls. We do know that there is one who is the balm of Gilead and it is Jesus. He is the master physician. He's the one who prunes us. He's the one who heals us. And so my encouragement to us today as we sit with broken hearts is to continue to bring our hearts before the Lord, to continue to share that before the Lord. Lord, it's still sore and I I come to you for comfort. I come to you to, to call bash me. I come to you to put me back together to make me whole again. This is the restoration that Jesus offers us. Next slide, please. But not only for ourselves, but Jesus invites us to participate in the restoration of wounded hearts of other people too. This is part of our purpose. And so who do you know who is heartbroken right now? Who do you know uh, who's, who's struggling internally? And that's your place to be kind, to send a text message, hey, I'm thinking of you, to sit next to them, to visit them in hospital, to, to be Jesus for them to bring restoration to wounded hearts. Okay, we are coming into land now with our final point, and it is Jesus has been sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And in Jesus' lifetime, we see him doing all kinds of work that is freeing captives from their prisons. Jesus frees people from the prison of disease. We see this in Mark chapter 1, verse 40, as an example. There's a man healed of leprosy, but we see all kinds of healings. A man born blind is healed, receives his sight. We see people raised from the dead. Jesus is a healer. We've been singing about this this morning. Jesus uh, heals people who are prisoners to demonic affliction. We've already talked about Satan. We know that there is an enemy of our souls, and we know that there is a spiritual world. And we see this in Luke chapter 8 from verse 26, that there is a person who uh, is a demoniac, meaning that they've got many demons that are occupying him. And when Jesus comes to his proximity, he falls down in front of Jesus and he says, whoa, Jesus, what are you doing here? Okay, he recognizes Jesus and without any fuss, Jesus says, get out of him. And we know that there's a whole, uh, the demons go into a herd of pigs and those herd of pigs rush off the side of a cliff. It's quite a, a spectacular passage. So he heals people from disease. Jesus heals people from demonic affliction. Jesus heals people from literal prisons. So Peter in Acts chapter 12 is released from prison. An angel is sent, the, the, the prison is um, knocked down and we see that, uh, that Peter is able to walk free and be released from his prison. And we have so many pitfalls, don't we? We, we run in so many different places to heal that, that aching of our souls. I know for me, I've got to watch out. I'm a, a Premier League uh, soccer enthusiast. I enjoy Man United. Um, hopefully better days for us in coming, coming season. Uh, but I know that Jesus invites me to come and to seek refuge with him. He is, he is my fortress. He is my strong tower. Right? He invites me to come and to heal and get restored. But so very often, I run to the shelter of YouTube and I run to the shelter of Optus three-minute highlights and I just camp out there. And that's where, <laughs> if I'm not careful, addiction can form, right? We get addicted to distraction where the Lord is saying, no, like I've actually come to bring life and to bring healing and bring life to the full. And you know, there are many ways 
that we can get addicted to things in this life. Next slide, please. And so I want to encourage you that Jesus does bring restoration from spiritual and physical prisons. We see Jesus do this in his life and in his ministry. I'm sure that many of us in this room will have seen people uh, healed miraculously or, or seen spiritual evil uh, sent away. This is a claim that we still have. So I encourage you, if you're dealing with addictions, if you're dealing uh, with um, physical infirmities, come to Jesus. Continue to pray for one another, believing that his spirit still is at work, still doing these things. And not only that, but let's take that same hope, that same trust that Jesus is who Isaiah said he was, the restorer. And we can also pray for other people when they have illnesses. And we can also uh, you know, pray for them and, and believe for them and, and hope and pray that the Lord is going to reveal to them who Jesus is so they can be restored from their spiritual darkness. Last slide, please. And so as we finish, Jesus is the uh, fulfillment of what Isaiah 61 talks about. 700 years later, he comes and says to the people of his time, I am this person. I am the restorer. We get invited into this restoration as well because we carry that same spirit of Christ with us. We are directed by the Lord to go into a dark and hurting world, bringing his light, to restore purpose, to restore material and spiritual poverty, to restore wounded hearts, and to break prisoners free from their chains. And this is something that we can just absolutely celebrate. And I want to thank you uh, for your work. As you know that as you give to Baptist World Aid, that it's also happening in, in the far reaches of, of the planet. It's, it's good work, and I thank you so much for partnering with it. Let's pray. It's really overwhelming, Jesus, that the Bible threads itself together in such an amazing way, Lord, that a, that a person sent by you to speak about somebody 700 years in the future and that it would come to pass. And that's not the only thing. There are, there are literally hundreds of prophecies about Jesus that have come to pass. He is the promised Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the one who is living and active and hold all things together. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We come to you today, Jesus, thanking you that you invite us to participate in the restoration that you are bringing to the world. What an honour, what a privilege. Help us have eyes to see and help us to get involved in the work that you are doing here, Lord, so even in the darkness, your light can shine. We praise you, Lord. Amen.